So uh, I asked him if, if we could do it that way, and he said, of course, do whatever you want to do with it. And so it became Midnight Train to Georgia. The Empress of Soul, Gladys Knight, is a seven-time Grammy winner known for her performances in Gladys Knight and the Pips. This is my life and as well as her remarkable solo career. Behind this career, however, are trials that held her back. Let's take a look at it from the start. Early life. Gladys Knight was born on May 28, 1944 in Atlanta to postal worker Merrill Woodlow Knight Sr. and Sarah Elizabeth, completing a happy family of six. This included Knight's sister Brenda and two brothers known as Merrill Bubba Knight Jr. and David Billy Knight, who all loved music thanks to their parents' influence. As such, Knight's life was steeped in music from the start, with her parents singing in a gospel choir called Wings Over Jordan. This would lead to Knight singing gospel music at Mount Moriah Baptist Church for the first time at the age of four. Yet this was just the beginning. As Knight got older, she fell even more in love with music as by the time she was seven, she was already turning heads, singing with the Morris Brown College Choir and in recitals at churches and schools. She even won first place on the show The Original Amateur Hour in 1952 for singing a song by Nat King Cole called Too Young, earning her a hefty $2,000 in the process. Not bad for a seven-year-old. However, everything really started with a story that took place at her brother Bubba's birthday party in 1952. At the party, when the music player broke, Gladys, Bubba, Brenda, and their cousins Eleanor and William Guest decided to take matters into their own hands and sing together instead. Their mom, Elizabeth Knight, saw how amazing their performance was and urged them to start a group. Just like that, the Pips came to be, named after their cousin James Wood, whom everyone called Pip. The start of the Pips. The Pips quickly made a name for themselves, winning talent shows in Atlanta which led to Brunswick Records noticing them and signing them in 1957. Having been signed, it was only upward for them, and at a shockingly young age, too. Before Knight was even a teenager, she was already hitting the road with big names like Jackie Wilson and Sam Cooke. However, even though that must have been a cool experience, their first recording in 1957 with Brunswick was a total flop. No worries, though, as they weren't phased by this bump and expanded the group with cousins Edward and Langston when Brenda and Guest left to get hitched. With these new members, they were going to land a hit in no time. So fast forward to 1960, and what do you know, they drop every beat of my heart, and it's a hit, climbing right up to number six on the rhythm and blues charts by July 1961. Unfortunately, this success was short-lived as things got a bit rocky. Langston decided to leave the group after a couple more singles, like Letter Full of Tears in 1962, which did pretty okay. However, without Langston and with Gladys Knight having kids, the group hit a bit of a slump, which resulted in the Pips doing backup gigs. When Langston left, they became a foursome, and Gladys was in and out until she came back for good in 1964, officially becoming Gladys Knight and the Pips. As a quartet, they were rhythm and blues darlings, but not really hitting the big time. Although they did sign with Fury Records, which was a big deal in the rhythm and blues world, they then switched to Max Records in 1964, and things kind of stalled. Their breakthrough. Luckily, though, things started getting better by 1966, when they signed with Motown's Soul label and teamed up with Norman Whitfield, a real hotshot producer. Their success wasn't guaranteed yet, though, as Knight's voice was a bit different, so they didn't quite fit the mold at first. However, by the end of 1967, they released I Heard It Through the Grapevine, and it was a smash hit, sitting pretty at number two on the charts for three whole weeks and remaining a classic to this day. After this success, they got everyone grooving to the nitty-gritty in 1968 and Friendship Train in 1969, leading up to them dropping If I Were Your Woman in 1970, which became their best-selling release. Now, during these years and with this success, it was actually Knight who played a huge part in getting the Jackson 5 noticed. She wrote to the label owner, Barry Gordy, and told him that he had to check the Jackson 5 out, but somehow, people started thinking it was Diana Ross who discovered them instead. Interesting anecdote aside, Gladys Knight and the Pips still needed to achieve their success, yet the early 70s were a bit of a roller coaster. The group's sound got smoother and more mainstream, and it paid off with Neither One of Us Wants to Be the First to Say Goodbye, hitting the charts in 1972. It was at this moment that they upped and left their record label Motown in 1973, right when that song was climbing the charts. 
This was because they felt Motown wasn't giving them enough support after the label moved to Hollywood. So they switched to Buddha Records, and just like that, instant success. Their album, Imagination, was a gold mine, with hits like Midnight Train to Georgia that everyone still hums. Unfortunately, even though they were with Buddha, Motown kept releasing their stuff without paying them a dime, giving them the short end of the stick. As for that single, Neither One of Us, they never saw a cent for that one. Although this left a bad taste, the band moved on and kept releasing some good music. In 1974, they did the soundtrack for Claudine with Curtis Mayfield, and On and On was a hit. The next year, they had everyone singing along to I Feel a Song, and they just kept rolling with hits like The Way We Were and Try to Remember from their second anniversary album in 1975. During this same year, Gladys Knight and the Pips weren't just about the music, they were television stars too, with their very own show known as The Gladys Knight and the Pips Show. Sadly though, this show only lasted four episodes and was canceled afterwards. Yet this setback didn't discourage Knight, who tried her hand at acting in Pipe Dreams, a movie set against the chilly backdrop of Alaskan oil pipelines. Her performance was so good that she was nominated for a Golden Globe Award for New Star of the Year, giving her even more popularity in the process. Troubles with the Pips Even with all that fame though, it wasn't all smooth sailing. They hit some serious legal icebergs that made recording together with Knight an impossibility for three whole years, thanks to a messy label switch and a lawsuit with Motown. So Knight decided to do her own thing with a solo album, and the Pips kept busy with a couple of albums on Casablanca, but without their combined magic, their star power dimmed a bit. Then 1980 rolled around, and they settled things out of court, scoring a new deal with Columbia that lasted till 1985. Once they got back together, it was like they never missed a beat. They dropped All About Love and The Hit Landlord, which Ashford and Simpson, those songwriting legends, whipped up. Fast forward to 1982, and they're jamming at the Jamaican World Music Festival in Montego Bay. A few years later, in 1986, Knight sings That's What Friends Are For with Dionne Warwick and Elton John, snagging a Grammy for it. Furthermore, their album Visions gave us Save the Overtime, and they kept showing off their range with tunes that hit just right, whether they were rhythm and blues or more laid-back tracks. Then came 1988, and Love Overboard from their album of the same name blew up, becoming their hottest single in ages. They weren't finished though, as they topped it off with another Grammy in 1989 for Best Rhythm and Blues Performance. After Love Overboard took off and snagged a Grammy, Gladys Knight and the Pips decided to go their separate ways to chase different dreams. However, this didn't mean everyone had to split up and never see each other again. One of the guys behind the scenes, Bubba, handled all the business tasks for the Pips. Similarly, he became a road manager for Knight as she rocked the charts as a solo artist with the James Bond hit. License to Kill, making waves in the United Kingdom's top 10. So with the band broken up, Knight had no choice but to go completely solo, and she did. She stepped out solo for the first time at Constitution Hall on November 8, 1989, sharing the stage with the up-and-coming David Peaston. The two sang some amazing duets, mixing soulful hits from the 80s with a sprinkle of Knight's gospel heritage. This wasn't the only solo hit, though. Fast forward to the end of 1991, and Gladys drops Good Woman, an album that had the music world buzzing thanks to collabs with stars like Patti LaBelle and Dionne Warwick. This record showed she could still throw down with the best of them, holding her own against the likes of Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, and Karen White. The album's big number, Superwoman, had Knight LaBelle and Warwick teaming up to bring down the house and let's not forget Give Me a Chance, another hit duet with David Peaston. Knight even got personal, penning tunes like the heartfelt Waiting on You, which was an emotional nod to the Persian Gulf War. However, life's not just about the spotlight and the stage because Knight had her share of personal dramas too, all happening in the background of her professional life. It's now time to take a look at her personal troubles and relationships, of which there are plenty. Relationships and Family Troubles It all started back when she made the honor roll at Shaw University, but life threw her a curveball when she got pregnant at the age of 16. So she tied the knot with her fellow Atlanta musician and classmate James Jimmy Newman back in 1960. They weathered a miscarriage and went on to have two kids, but things got tough when Newman fell into drug addiction and left the family, leaving 20-year-old Gladys to hold down the fort. Knight and James Newman had quite the journey together, staying hitched for a dozen years until 1973. The couple had some good times, though, welcoming their son, 
James Jimmy Gaston Newman III, into the world on August 13, 1962. This led to Knight taking a break from touring to be a mom, while the Pips kept the music alive on the road as we mentioned at the start. Then, in November 1963, they had their daughter, Kenya Maria Newman, whom Knight had to take time off to raise as well. After a while, though, Knight got back into the studio with the Pips to support her growing family. So how did she manage both her career and family at the same time? It happened in the swinging 60s, when the whole crew, Knight, James, and the Pips, made the move to Detroit. They settled in Sherwood Forest on Sherborne Road, a pretty luxurious part of town where the kids went to Gesu Catholic grade school, getting their education while their mom was laying down tracks. Unfortunately though, after seven years apart, Knight and Newman called it quits in 1973, and sadly, he passed away a few years later. Knight didn't stay single for long though. In October of 1974, she married Barry Hankerson, the man behind Blackground Records. Yep, the same label that signed his niece, the rhythm and blues sensation, Aaliyah. The couple had a son, Shanga Ali Hankerson, born on August 1, 1976. Later on, around 1977, they packed up and moved to Atlanta, leaving the Pips back in Detroit. Unfortunately, things got rocky, and by 1979, they were in the middle of a nasty custody fight over their son, which took a toll on the poor kid whose upbringing was less than ideal. See, when Shanga was just three years old, he was kidnapped and was missing for a heart-wrenching five to six months. Knight spent over a million dollars searching for him, and she had to hustle for that money, working twice as hard to scrape it together. Despite this traumatic event, that was just the beginning for Shanga. He had a rough time growing up as by 11, he weighed a whopping 320 pounds. It took a family effort to help him shed the weight, something Knight talks about in her 1997 autobiography, Between Each Line of Pain and Glory. That struggle with weight was just one piece of the puzzle, as according to Knight, it was a reflection of the tough times Shanga faced because of the drama between his parents. So, although Knight has quite a few ideas about her son in her book, she doesn't reveal everything, especially Shanga's later years. In these years, Shanga ended up at the helm of a company accused by former employees of financial misconduct and by the state agents of owing a hefty sum in unpaid taxes. While no definite explanation exists of how this ended up happening, we can still take a look at his early childhood to glean some insights from Knight. Knight herself talks about the tough times they had with money and emotions when he was a kid, which hints at why things might have gotten rocky for him later on. Shanga grew up in a family that wasn't exactly sending love letters to the tax man. Knight herself had a million-dollar headache with the Internal Revenue Service, and she turned to the casino tables trying to dig herself out of that hole. She's pretty upfront about it in the Tell All book, saying she felt the government just didn't care about people. When Shanga was just a little boy in elementary school, Knight's gambling wasn't just a hobby, it was a full-blown addiction. It got so bad she'd miss his school drop-offs and her mom had to step in. She'd be at the tables till the afternoon, calling her mom to pick up Shanga because she was still trying to win big. Those days were super tense along with Knight and Barry Hankerson's messy divorce with a custody battle that must have felt like a never-ending storm for Shanga. He started looking for comfort, and he found it in food. It's like he was trying to fill a void that just kept getting bigger. Knight did everything she could, getting doctors and diet specialists on board, even sending Shanga to weight loss camps, but nothing seemed to stick. She admits there were times she lost her patience and said hurtful things to Shanga like fat slob, which she regretted. Knight was taken aback by her own words, the kind that sting long after they're spoken, and Shanga kept his composure on the outside, but inside, the pain was real. Knight wondered how she could be so hurtful to her own son and wished to undo the pain she inflicted on Shanga. Now, Shanga's school and some help from Richard Simmons and Weight Watchers camp seemed to make a difference for him. However, it was the move to Los Angeles, to a new home where he could be closer to his father, that really turned things around. By the time he hit high school, he was living with his dad, who managed stars like pop sensation Aaliyah and the gospel group, The Winans. At 21, with some financial help from his dad and other partners, Shanga opened what would become the famous Gladys Knight's Chicken and Waffles restaurant. That year also saw the release of Knight's autobiography, where she expressed her pride in Shanga and all her children. However, Shanga's journey as a restaurateur hit some bumps because he found himself in hot water, accused of using his chicken and waffle joints in a racketeering operation for over 16 years. The lawsuit claimed that Shanga funneled taxes from his three restaurants into his own pockets, snapping up cash, 
real estate, and other assets. This blew up back in 2016 when Shanga got out of Clayton County Jail on a $20,000 bond after being accused of owing a million dollars in taxes, penalties, and interest, and facing two counts of theft. The police raided Shanga's restaurants and the main office, and at the same time, they hit him with a lawsuit asking the court for permission to seize several bank accounts and properties. Not only that, news came out that Shanga was accused of taking money from his restaurants to pay for his marijuana addiction and some wild parties. This whole situation was really tough on the employees. They had been working hard in some awful conditions while not getting the pay they should. Some managers even had to use their own money to make sure things kept running. Like one manager, who was one of Shanga's old friends, used his own credit card to pay $12,000 to keep the company's health insurance from being canceled. When Shanga got arrested on June 22, 2016 for stealing, he was accused of taking about $52,000 in state taxes. The company was supposed to be making $8 million a year, but it was actually falling apart. The managers were in such a tight spot that they had to use cash from the safe just to cover the employees' bounced checks before Shanga's people could take it. To make things worse, all of this bad reputation hurt Knight in the process. Knight was really upset with her son for trying to ruin her reputation, saying that he was trying to extort and blackmail her by lying and saying she's sick with dementia and Alzheimer's. She was so worried about her name being dragged through the mud that she went to court to get her name taken off the chicken and waffles restaurants. After a stretch of some pretty questionable business moves that smeared his mom, Shanga ended up with a two-year sentence in federal prison in 2021. Plus, he got tagged with a year of supervised release and a million-dollar tab to pay back. During this turmoil, though, Knight had her own personal dramas going on. After being divorced from Shanga's father, Barry Hankerson, she started hanging out with Les Brown in 1993. This was a man celebrated for his empowering speeches and his best-selling work, Living Your Dreams. Brown, a single parent and divorcee, found a connection with Knight, declaring her his soulmate, while Knight felt the same way calling Brown her heart in a touching interview. Their romance led to marriage on August 29, 1995, but the relationship dissolved by 1997. Knight wouldn't be alone for too long, though, as her heart found its match once more in William McDowell, a spa manager she'd met a decade earlier, and they wed on April 12, 2001. Fast forward to 2003, and Knight's talking about her love life to Jet Magazine. She said her marriage to Brown was like a tough class in what she didn't want. But with McDowell, despite the age gap, she has been over the moon. He's everything she prayed for, and now he's even helping run her business and sell houses. However, there's still plenty more to talk about when it comes to Knight's career. So let's dive back into this stellar journey, picking it back up in the 90s. The 90s and 2000s. In 1996, after rocking the stage for nearly half a century, Knight finally got her moment in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame spotlight. Mariah Carey, the diva herself, did the honors, talking about how Knight's voice was the real deal, the kind that could send shivers down your spine with just a note. Despite feeling like the music business was all about up-and-coming singers, Knight still had a legion of fans who couldn't get enough of her tunes. They knew the real gold when they heard it. While focusing on her career, Knight still kept it close family-wise. Her son Jimmy, who'd been managing her shows, passed away in 1996, and her daughter Kenya stepped up to fill his shoes. At this time, her youngest, Shanga Ali, took the reins of the family's chicken and waffles restaurants in Atlanta. And let's not forget the grandkids. She's got a whole bunch, and they're following in her footsteps, with at least one sharing the stage with her. After splitting from Brown in 1997, Knight found a new path with the Mormon faith and she's been all in, finding strength in her beliefs, especially during the tough times after Jimmy's passing. Coming back to her career though, Knight kept the show going, dropping at last in 2001, her first non-gospel album in six years. And guess what? She had her then-teenage grandson, Rashawn, right there with her in the studio. That album snagged a Grammy, proving Knight still had the magic touch. After Knight's Grammy triumph, she scored a gig at the Flamingo in Las Vegas, a city she'd long called home. She told Jet Magazine it was just what she needed, a steady spot to sing without the hassle of touring. Her show, a mix of her classics and Motown hits, quickly became a must-see, and her stint was extended well into 2007. Fast forward to 2015, and Knight was back on the dance charts with Just a Little, her first dance single in nearly 20 years, hinting at her upcoming 12th studio album. 
She also circled back to her gospel roots with the album Where My Heart Belongs, which won a National Association for the Advancement of Colored People Image Award in 2014. That holiday season, Knight graced the small screen in the Lifetime movie Seasons of Love, acting alongside stars like Taraji P. Henson. She didn't stop there, though, making a guest appearance in the hit series Empire. At this time, she came out with her eighth solo album, Another Journey, which had fans swaying to I Who Have Nothing and the Randy Jackson-produced Settle. Her song You and I Ain't Nothing No More also featured in the acclaimed film The Butler, adding to her list of hits. Knight wasn't just lighting up stages, she was also imparting wisdom on television, serving as a musical mentor on Apollo Live, where she, alongside Dougie Fresh and Michael Bivens, offered her insights to hopefuls aiming to make their mark in showbiz. Then, in 2012, she put on her dancing shoes, joining Dancing with the Stars and showing off her moves with Tristan McManus. Of all her accomplishments, though, 2011 was a standout year for Knight, filled with tributes and accolades. She paid homage to Michael Jackson in Cardiff, sharing the stage with stars like Jennifer Hudson and Beyonce. Not long after, she herself was celebrated with a Legend Award at the Soul Train Awards, an honor she shared with Earth, Wind & Fire. Knight, being a huge fan of Las Vegas, would return to the city where her name lit up the Tropicana Hotel. This was an event that took place at the newly renamed Gladys Knight Theater, which was a historic first, as it was the first venue named after an African-American performer. This came on the heels of her acclaimed four-year run at the Flamingo. Offstage, though, her heart for charity shone bright as she supported the Boys and Girls Club with a song donation of the dream. Furthermore, as the voice behind Midnight Train to Georgia, she was the perfect host for Amtrak's National Train Day celebrations in the District of Columbia. Around this time, though, in February 2011, Knight had this epic reunion with Elton John, Dionne Warwick, and Stevie Wonder. They hadn't performed together in 25 years, and they brought back That's What Friends Are For at a big AIDS research event in New York. After that, Knight hit the road in the United Kingdom, even rocking a sold-out show at Wembley Stadium. Knight's album Before Me was a shout-out to legends like Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington, who were her buddies, mentors, and inspirations. Then she teamed up with the Saints Unified Voices Choir again for a Christmas celebration, putting a soulful twist on holiday favorites. This was after their first album, One Voice Snagged a Grammy. Knight kept the awards coming winning another Grammy with Ray Charles for Heaven Help Us All, and her own album, At Last, got one too, featuring a duet with Jamie Foxx. She even co-wrote This Is Our Time with her husband William McDowell for the 2002 Winter Olympics. It was also time for her to dabble a bit in film and television once again. Her voice graced the end credits of Tyler Perry's The Family That Prays Together, and she even starred in his I Can Do Bad All By Myself. She's done voice work for the animated holidays, and acted alongside Harrison Ford in Hollywood Homicide. Knight also popped up on television shows like 30 Rock, Las Vegas, Jag, and even played Jamie Foxx's mom on his show. Suffice it to say, Knight has done a lot throughout her time, so what is she doing these days? Nowadays, at the age of 79, Knight's running her empire from Vegas with William and the family. She's juggling life as a singer, a restaurant owner, and a matriarch, all while keeping her faith front and center. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.